like 10 plus number of students, but we can right. expect yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so will you mind if we start exactly at 740? Yeah, another like two, three minutes three from minutes, now. That's yeah, oh. that's fine. We can do that. So I was going to say uh, getting people to read originals is extremely difficult, extremely difficult. <laughs> Uh, I will say getting you know, them to read is also equally yeah. difficult. <laughs> Forget about the original part and all. And yeah. now it's only YouTube videos, eh? Right. Yes. A different world. Unfortunately, uh, Sudipta, I, I have a class I am teaching at, a, at in a half hour time. So, but I will stay for the first. And of course, I have listened to you already on this thing. I should mention to you that I once gave a talk in India, in New Delhi, while I was still with the UN Development Program, uh, entitled the talk, Small is Ugly. Ah. <laughs> it, was, it was a direct pun on Schumacher's work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I surveyed thousands of uh, micro enterprises in Old Delhi, in Rio de Janeiro, and in South Africa, and so on. And the yeah. conditions under which these people live and work were so horrible. I mean, you yeah. know, yeah. All, we all look to the, the kind, we, what we call the job creation machine of small, medium enterprises. Right. We don't always look at the conditions under which they work and the poverty in which micro entrepreneurs live, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's, that's what that presentation was about. No, I, I mean, I think it's a very, very valid point. Uh, I think often we don't uh, think about these things. But uh, yeah, indeed, micro enterprises, small, medium enterprises, the life conditions of workers, and, and for the micro enterprises, even the owners, they live in, you know, not so very nice conditions. But even small enterprises that are working conditions for people who are engaged in them, it's not necessarily very nice. That's right. Yeah, but of course, it's survival. A, you know, it's survival. We, we, Naresh, we started off um, making a reference to P.G. Woodhouse, and uh, and this is this is what we are now concerned about opening up, um, you know, uh, to Walmart and all the big big giants, and what will happen to the the poor poor Kirana store um, down the road, and you know, yes, they, their present conditions may not be very good, but at least there's some some dignity. Uh, and uh, yeah, sense of, making your own living, yeah, yeah making your own living, right? I mean, you know, I, one of the nice things about India is that we can tolerate uh, high levels of what you might regard as deprivation because you know um, there's a certain adaptation. I mean, you know, not wanting possessions, um, living a simple life. You know, uh, he has a makes a Philippa makes a reference to Ayers and Iyengar, so I have to say. That um, you know, there's such a thing as as um, as uh, um, there's there's um, simple living and higher thinking. Higher thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess like it's 7:40. Uh, given like all of us, we have a time constraint. So, with permission from uh, uh, Professor Shudarshan, I'm just giving yeah, it a sure. start. Go ahead, Subaran, yeah. your hands. So a very warm welcome to Professor Sarangi from our side, uh, from my side as well, because he was my teacher back at LSU and he taught us and uh, definitely did this to mention, we enjoyed your class. But for those who don't know him, as a very brief introduction about him. Uh, Professor Sarangi is department head of uh, the Department of Economics at uh, Virginia Polytechnic and the State University. And prior to joining VT, he was a distinguished professor of uh, business administration at LSU Business School. And he was also the program director at uh, National Science Foundation. His research interests ranges from experimental economics to let's say network uh, economics to behavioral economics. And he has been consultant to uh, institutions like World Bank, as well as food and agricultural organizations. And he currently serves uh, as an in the editorial boards of Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, uh, Journal of Public Economic Theory, as well as Studies in Microeconomics. So it's all over to Professor Sarangi. I didn't want to waste with a 
long uh, introduction. The I, I think like Professor Sarangi will introduce himself through his presentation, through his talk, and uh, it's all over to you, Professor Sarangi. Students, please feel free to ask your questions at the end. Whoever has any question, please hold on to your horses. We'll take take your questions once the talk is over. And I'm quite sure, like Professor Sarangi, will enjoy your questions the way he had given a scope even in the classroom and also in the happy hours too. So, Professor Sarang, it's all up to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sivaran. It's uh, actually a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, I have, you know, um, when, when there was no COVID, I usually come to India at least two to three times every year, and my in-laws are in Delhi, so, so usually the stop is Delhi. Uh, I had not been to Jindal, so I'm happy to be able to visit you yeah. all virtually. So um, good to see uh, Professor Dashan and uh, Professor Singh who has chimed in from Canada. So it's wonderful. Good morning to you and uh, welcome to all the other student staff and faculty. So, uh, and as Shuvan said, and I hope you will see that I really enjoy teaching and part of this, uh, part of this hopefully will come through the presentation. Uh, uh, and uh, what I will do is I have a brief presentation, not very long, but I'll do that. And once we are done with that, uh, I will allow people to ask me questions and uh, we'll, we'll take things and we'll talk about whatever you have and I can show you some other stuff as well. So uh, with that, let's get started with the economics of small things. Normally, you know, uh, today, if you go to an econ talk, uh, the slide on the left is what you expect. Right, so this is the typical talk. This is actually a slide from one of my own network papers. Let me see if I can find a. Right, I seem to have lot. Yeah. So, in fact, if you look at this, this is a lot of math, but it says something very simple, right? So, this whole thing called Katz Bonnet State Centrality basically tells you the influence of a person in a network. So, what you do is you take an individual and find all the paths from this individual to everybody else in the network, and you say that's the Katz Bonnet, Katz -Bonnet State Centrality. That's a measure of their importance. But I don't want to go into these kinds of things. Today, we're here to talk about the economics of small things, okay? What we see around us. We're here to talk about economics in the mundane. And my idea behind that is exactly what you see in this painting. This is a painting by the French surrealist, René Magritte. Um, this painting, obvious biblical reference, uh, is called The Son of Man. You can see the apple in front. And <clears throat> I think that when we look around us, there are layers of things, okay? So everything has layers and there is stuff that is hidden behind what is apparent to us. Magritte's idea was people are interested in not see, which is why he made the face and then he covered the face with an apple to pique your curiosity so that you want to know what is behind. And that's exactly what I think, that our everyday activities, there is a lot of economics behind them. And I want to go behind to show you what you are interested in or what is covered by the apple, the things that lie behind the apple. That's what I want to uncover, okay? What you do not see, which is covered by what you see. I want to uncover that. That's the goal of this book. And of course, the other thing as everybody um, who has had a chance to look through the book will realize this is really a book that does not want to rely on Western examples. I want to rely on Indian examples, facets of life we are all familiar with, take stories from there, okay? So that's the basic idea of this book. So let me start by uh, talking about something that, you know, almost everybody who has been introduced to any sort of uh, economics will know, incentives matter, right? We all know incentives matter because uh, you know, if you think about uh, performance bonuses, if you think about people who work on a commission, right? These are all ideas that if I want to motivate you to perform higher, to increase your productivity, I give you a monetary incentives. Of course, incentives don't always have to be monetary. Uh, academics fight over corner offices or people in big high rise buildings fight over corner offices, window offices. Um, companies give out star of uh, employee of the month award, right? What is an employee of the month? It's peer recognition. It's the fact that we recognize you in front of all the other people in your group. So this, this 
is also a strong motivator. People are, are willing to increase effort in the face of such things. Okay. I don't This is a stand-up comic called Abhishek Kumanyu. And I've actually decided that stand-up comics are a great way to learn economics because what they do is they put human behavior under a microscope. They really put human behavior under a microscope and they think about facets of life in way only economists do, or maybe psychologists also, right? So we really try to understand the basics of human behavior. So anyway, so you know, I don't really watch a lot of TV. A few days back, I happened to come across an episode on YouTube, five minute episode by this guy, Abhishek Okamanyu, uh, and he tells an interesting story. He remembers that when they were kids, his mother would tell them on uh, his grandparent, his grandmother's death anniversary or his grandfather's death anniversary, she would give them food and say, go give this food to poor people, okay? Now, if you, he says, now, this is very interesting because think what will happen if the poor people realize that death implies free food, okay? The incentives are completely perverse. What they would start doing then is bumping off people. If that leads to free food for them, then the incentives are problematic. So what I want to get at is, yes, these ideas are very good, but they can have unintended consequences. Um, during, during the colonial times, Delhi apparently had a lot of uh, cobras, okay? So the British decided, the British rulers of Delhi decided that they will pay people for dead cobras. Now, it turns out it's not very difficult to raise cobras. So guess what the intrepid citizens of Delhi started doing? They started rearing cobras. And, and in fact, although this, this is sort of an anecdotal story, it's not very well documented, and it's been called the cobra effect by a German economist called Horst Seibert. What is interesting is that while the one in Delhi is not documented, this actually happened in Hanoi in Vietnam. So this, this is the French who were in charge, who were ruling Vietnam, and they decided there are too many rats in Hanoi. So they decided to offer the local population money in exchange for dead rats. Well, what do you think happened? People started rearing rats and then bringing dead rats. Of course, at some point, the governments realize, or you know, the policymakers realize, Remember, I'm talking about policies. Policymakers realize that this is a bad idea. So they decide to abandon the policy. Now, what do you think happens when you abandon the policy after people have been rearing cobras and rearing rabbits oh, or rot, uh, rats? Quite likely, you end up with more cobras and more rats than you had before. Okay. One of the most interesting instances of this that happened in modern times is during the midst of the civil war in Sudan. So um, North and South Sudan were engaged in a civil war. And as a result of this conflict, when one group was to the other, uh, you know, um, so the Muslim group would keep Christians as slaves. So then a charitable organization in Zurich was very moved by the plight of women and children slaves. And they decided to buy freedom for the slaves. Now imagine man with bags full of cash, so the in Sudan and says, I'm here to buy freedom for slaves. The incidence of slavery went up. It's like saying, you know, Santa and Banta decide. Okay, today I am my slave, I'll buy your freedom. I will keep, you know, making money this way. So in this sense, whether you are going for a policy job or forget even policy, you know, even if you go to the, even if you go to the corporate sector, right? You go to, uh, you have a marketing job. you have to be aware of the second order or these unintended consequences. Let me give you two, two examples. Uh, so the red man Q, you know the classic example, Sam Peltzman's story about seat belts. So when seat belts were introduced in the United States, the number of accidents did not go down. Instead, pedestrian casualties went up. Why? Because the drivers who were wearing seat belts more, uh, felt more safe, so they would drive more rashly and they would survive the crashes because they had seat belts. Pedestrians were not so lucky, right? So that's that's one thing. 
Uh, the other one that, uh, you know, one that people have documented very well is uh, these pictures of, uh, you know, damaged lungs and damaged throats on cigarette packets. So after some thinking, behavioral scientists realized this is not a very good idea because in order to see the picture, you have to first buy the packet of cigarettes. Okay, so they realized that this campaign was not a particularly helpful or useful campaign. So that's the sense in which I wanted to talk about why incentives matter, but you should be aware of unintended consequences. I mean, it's one example of the kind of thinking I want to bring to you from everyday life. So in fact, my advice to people is, watch stand-up comics. If you want to uh, have a good look at microeconomics, watch some stand-up comics. They put us under the microscope. This is a, a shot of the table of contents for the book. So if you look at the first chapter, that's about uh, group lending and joint liability. In other words, that's about the work of Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank. So it talks about adverse selection, moral hazard, costly auditing, and why these things work for the Grameen Bank. The economics of video rentals talks about um, how late fines can be used for price discrimination, where have all the other mangoes gone. That's really about the third law of demand. In God We Trust is about repeated games. And it's the idea, and this was inspired by our driver in India and many other drivers who will never wear a seatbelt in India, but every time they cross a temple or a mosque or a church or whatever, they will say a small prayer, prayer right? But they will refuse to wear a seatbelt which can protect them. So uh, there's an old, uh, there's uh, an essay by Gandhi, which I was happened to be reading. And then I saw something interesting in it. Chapter 25 is about the pandemic. Of course, uh, P.G. Woodhouse, chapter 24, the one on P.G. Woodhouse is the very first chapter I wrote. Actually, it's the very, very first piece of popular writing I ever did. Uh, I know that Professor Sudarshan is a big fan. So there's, there's that. Um, there's a detour, the chapter 17 on palaces, Raki and game theory is actually a detour about a trip to Istanbul. Um, but for, for now, I want to focus on another story from everyday life. And that's the chapter called the first piece of cake. So, um, um, to, go, to get into the story, you have to understand that, um, you know, my daughter, um, oh, she's in fifth grade, and this happened last sometime last year, at the very beginning of last year. She's a friend called Christina who visits us, and so they play, and sometimes my daughter goes to visit them. And so uh, they will both play in our house, and usually at some point, you know, we'll go and give the girls something to eat. So on one particular day, I went and offered them two pieces of chocolate. Now, instead of waiting for her friend to grab a piece of chocolate, my daughter reached out first and grabbed a piece of chocolate, okay? And so when she left, when Christina left, obviously my daughter got a bit of a scolding and then we tried to explain to her that, you know, guests are important. You have to let the guests choose first. So we all, we sh then if you look around the world, you know, hospitality is part of many Asian cultures, right? So Japanese will go a long way towards putting out a red carpet for the guests. Uh, Middle East is, you know, is way over the top when it comes to hospitality. And there's, there's a bit I'd say about uh, in Egypt, there is this whole idea of a sailor's invitation. I mean, even Egyptians laugh at it. It is so absurd. Imagine two people on their boats in the middle of the Nile. And if they meet each other, they will invite the other person to come over to their boat for lunch. Of course, both of them know they're not going to do that because you can't leave your boat in the middle of the Nile and hop onto other, another boat. Your boat is just going to go away. So everybody knows that this is just a gesture, but they go out of the way to do this, right? So Middle East, um, in places like Philippines, in Armenia, they're very close to what we believe. They say the guest is God's messenger. In India, we say Atithi Deva Bhava. Why do we do this? Why? Do we place, why do we say this is good manners? It's cultural. Why do we place the guest on the same pedestal as God? If you really think about it, um, what does evolution suggest? Evolution suggests don't do that. Grab the food while it's available, right? Because if you don't, somebody else eats the food, it's not good for your survival. So Darwinian dynamics would suggest that you grab the food. Okay, what would efficiency tell us? Well, if you're all students of economics, we would say efficiency suggests find out who is hungriest, 
rank people in terms of their hunger and allocate the food according to the hunger ranking, right? The hungriest person getting the food first and so on would maximize social welfare. So what was I doing trying to teach my daughter to go against her evolutionary instincts, to disregard evolution? And as an economist, why am I saying, let's not do the efficient thing, right? Ask yourself this question. If you think about it, I can give you selfish reasons for why you might want to do this, right? It, in other words, why is it in your own interest to go against evolution Thank you. Uh, or even against efficiency, okay? So to start with, let's imagine, let's take the simplest example, which, um, you know, Jim and Journey, the experimental and theoretical economist Jim and Journey suggested, why are we nice to other people? One of the reasons we are nice to other people is it gives us a warm glow makes us feel good inside. So part of the reason why we like being kind, human beings like being kind because they feel good when they are kind to others. So he coined a word for it, he called it warm glow, right? The spirit, if you want to think about it. Or to do, I mean, in India, we've taken it one level further. We say, not only will you get to feel good personally, but you know, you're also earning punya on your trip to heaven you're earning some points, right? So, so we also have additional incentive to be nice to others. But there, there are other instances. In fact, evolution might even suggest that you should do this. So if food is scarce and you're looking for a new partner, what should you do? You should actually offer the food to your partner because that you are a good partner. You have the ability to withstand hunger. In other words, you can be a good mate in a partnership or you know, whatever kind of enterprise you're thinking, you can be a good partner. So maybe that's the reason you should offer it to the other person. Another reason could be if you're trying to impress somebody or make them feel obligated, you want to start a new partnership, you want the other person to be beholden to you, well, do them a favor, right? Impress them. When you go out on a date, you're trying to impress the other person with everything you have. So you're being nice, polite, you know, best manners. That's the reason reason why we do these things in best manners. So you could ask, well, why is it a part of culture or why is it a part of religion? If you think about why it's a part of culture, one explanation at least that I have and, and why Middle Eastern cultures have hospitality that's over the top is that if you think about the Silk Road, what did the Silk Road do? In ancient days, that was the highway that brought in trade, right? So that brought in new ideas, new goods. Unfortunately, it also brought in new diseases. But mainly, travel was difficult and trade was the way you maximized your utility, right? We all know gains from trade. So trade is what helped you do that. And at a time when trade is very difficult to do, if you and your community is not hospitable, what will happen? The travelers will not want to stop or the traders will not want to stop at your town. So people went out of their way to be hospitable to others, which made it a part of culture. Similarly, if you think about religion, why is it that we want to encode it in religion? Well, if food is scarce, okay, or even if food is not scarce, imagine you finished cooking, that thing looks so delicious that you cannot resist temptation, right? So we've all read stories about how somebody meant to eat, you know, like just one, one slice of that cake, but before they realize half the cake is gone. So by Calling by equating your guests to God, by putting them on the same pedestal as God, what have you done? Now you've called, called this share of the food as God's food. And that's a lot more difficult to do, right? That is the same thing as the act of commitment. By putting a guest on the same pedestal as God, you are tying your hands down, okay? It's like burning the bridge. There is no going back. So once the bridge is burned, there's no going back. If you put the food away for God, your, you have the ability to fight the temptation to eat the food, okay? It's a pre-commitment device to put guest as, on the same pedestal as God. That's how economists would look at it, okay? I mean, I'm not saying that's the only way, but at least one way of thinking about how to look at these things is with that lens. Now let me come to another game uh, that's very, very interesting and that's all around us these days. And that's the game of chicken. Uh, what's the game of chicken? The game of chicken is, is a very simple game. Uh, imagine two people sitting in front of each other, okay? And they say, okay, here's the competition. We're both going to hold our breaths. 
The first person to stop holding their breath wins. Uh, sorry, the first person to stop holding the breath is the loser. So the, one, the winner is the one who can hold their breath for the longer time. Of course, you realize the danger in this game. The danger in this game is if you don't stop holding your breath, you will die. In fact, chicken is a game where reputation is more important than dying. So it's not surprising that politicians love to play this game, right? So if you look at uh, you know this picture, it's basically Donald Trump and Kim Jong Un. Both of them wanted to have this negotiation about nuclear weapons. Neither of them wants to stand down. In fact, the outcome, as often happens in this game of chicken between politicians, is both of them claim victory. Uh, the same thing when it comes to trade negotiations with China, Donald Trump and Xi Jinping, same kind of ideas, right? Of course, the this was originally made famous this, uh, by this movie called Rebel Without a Cause, starring James Dean. <clears throat> and the idea in this movie was, uh, or you see this, this iconic scene in the movie where these two drivers are just, uh, you know, a few hundred yards away from the edge of a cliff. And the game is they have to race to if the first person to swerve is the loser, the one that can keep going for a longer time is the winner. But of course, if you keep going forever, you will fall off the cliff. So you can easily imagine why Hollywood loved this, right? Because it's got danger, it's got masculinity, it's got young teenagers in the movie. So, uh, and, uh, you know, James Dean had the right persona. So of course, it became very famous. And this is the beginning of the game of chicken. Uh, another example of the game of chicken is this old story between, uh, I don't know if you can guess who this is. This is Robin Hood and this is Little John, right? This is the first meeting between uh, Robin Hood and Little John. And they meet uh, on a little stream in the green forest. And um, the street, there's a log on the stream which will only allow one person to pass. So uh, neither of them wants to give in. This is exactly the game of chicken. And during COVID times and social distancing, any narrow path, whether it is a jogging trail or it is a footpath, or it is in a grocery store with aisles, which is narrow, you know, we end up playing this game. Who's going to give way to the other person as they both approach each other? And of course, in the Robin Hood story, what happens is neither of them gives way, they fight, Robin Hood falls into the water, little John picks him up, and then they become good friends. He joins Robin Hood and they fight the sheriff of Nottingham, right? So, uh, but what I want to say that uh, during times of COVID or in any pandemic, close, uh, you know, close proximity is problematic, we often end up playing the game of chicken. And then of course, the latest episode of the game of chicken is uh, the game going on between the, uh, the Indian government and the farmers. Basically both side has dug itself into a situation where reputation is important. Neither side wants to give in, okay? And we are kind of in a stalemate. Every, every, both groups are interested in their reputation. Nobody gives, wants to give in. This is exactly the game of chicken. Okay, why did I show you this? Well, everybody knows what Kangana Ranath is known for. I mean, I think she has attitude, right? Lots of attitude. And the point I want to make is that in the game of chicken, attitude matters. So if you can establish a reputation for being crazy in the game of chicken, say for example, you know, before, before you get into the car, you take off the steering wheel. What are you telling your opponent? There's no way I'm giving up. I'm going to keep driving straight because I have no control. Or you decide to, uh, you know, drink a whole bottle of gin before you get into the car. What are you showing? I am completely drunk. Don't expect me to behave in a rational manner. So if you can, cons if you can sort of persuade your opponent that you're crazy by demonstrating attitude of some sort in a game of chicken, you are likely to win. Why? Because there are two equilibria. What are the two equilibria in the game of chicken? Person A swerves, person B drives straight. The other equilibria is person B swerves and person A drives straight. So if you can persuade the other person that you are crazy, they will immediately swerve because they know, okay, this person is never going to be, there's no point playing this game with this person. So whoever has attitude in the game of chicken is most likely to win, okay? This is, this is the other point I wanted to make um, with the game of chicken.
and of course, you know, everybody knows uh, this movie, um, right? So if you, you can always email me uh, at econsmallthings at gmail.com if you have questions, not just today, but later. Uh, I'm on Twitter. The book has a website. Uh, I can show you all the uh, peek at the website later, not for now. But there is an interesting feature on the website. You can ask me questions on the website. Please keep in mind that the question doesn't pop up immediately because I want to ensure that you know people are using the right kind of language and they're not you know putting bad stuff there. So I will have to approve questions, but you can always pose a question for me. Uh, and every now and then I do give out awards for the best question. So here's a question that I love that was posted by somebody who's doing PhD at uh, IIM Calcutta, a guy called Himadri Chakravarti. So Himadri asked me, that it's very common in India, when we go to the Sabziwala or the Mithaiwala, we will ask, uh, is it fresh? We know fully well, the guy is never going to say, no, it's not fresh. So why do we ask such questions? What's the point of asking the question when we already know the answer, okay? So uh, I'm not gonna give you the answer today. You'll have to go there to the website, read, but I provide a long detailed answer about um, you know, why this can happen, okay? I also want to say um, that if you, I mean, this is, this is a slide where I want to show actually two things. One is that it takes a team. Um, and so if you think about a production process, everybody plays a key role in the production process. Even the gods or the devas had to resort to the asuras to get hold of, uh, to get hold of the amrit, right? So the churning of the ocean required both sides to cooperate. So when people are working together, everybody is important in a team. It, it, it also depends on who is in the team. Everybody brings different skills to the team. So that's one point I want to make. The second thing I want to make, although this is my book, it has been part of a long journey. Many people have contributed to it. Um, my first grade teacher, Meera Pradhan, she taught me how to read and write. Uh, my friend Harish Modaran, who is now at the Indian Academy Rights on Agriculture, when he was in the Hindu business line, he's the one who persuaded me to write for them. My teachers at Kyodimal College, Shailaja Sivasubramaniam, uh, Jaibir Singh, K. Narayanan, people, um, of course, Professor Basu, without whose encouragement the book would never have been written. Um, students, you know, have asked me all kinds of questions. And you, you can see all kinds of people have contributed to this book from my daughter to my driver. They have, you know, raised questions that I have written about. Uh, people in people like Shubaran, who were my students, have asked me questions that have made me think. So I want to say thank you to everybody who has helped me write this book, which I have really enjoyed writing. And Well, I thought I covered a lot of ground, so I wanted to offer everybody a virtual chumpy. I can't offer you real chumpies, a virtual chumpy is the best I can do. So with that, um, I can stop talking. Uh, I will stop sharing the screen now. At some point, I might show you a website if people are interested, the website for the book. Uh, otherwise, I'm happy to take questions from everybody and anybody in the audience. Um, you want to see the website? Tell me when you want to see the website. Website, I'll show you the website also for the book. Yeah, Professor Sarangi, if you want to show us the website, uh, please go ahead and feel free. All right, and I think Nikhil has also has raised his hand, so he probably has a question. So, <clears throat> right. Uh, hello. It's, it's pretty yeah. late. Uh, it was a nice talk and it's, it's amazing to have economics simplified into so much. And I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Uh, so I had a question. So you talk about these contrasting ideas, you know, with, with small things that you're observing. 
um as an economist i feel that okay this is the bread and butter of an empirical economist this this trade off so where do i lean towards and often i don't have answers for my students like and as undergrad students they expect clear answers this side or that side and and my style of teaching is that i don't know this is the so so i just keep them open it often um uh, gives me bad reviews of teaching but i feel that's the honesty that i'm going from a profession so how do you deal with it when especially when you're talking about um the the piece of the cake actually it has both sides to it and there are like it's it's an empirical thing i feel like i, I don't know if there's a theoretical or a priori answer which i can imagine and take sides on to like i don't know i don't really know <laughs> All right, fantastic question. Fantastic question. I love this question, particularly, especially if you are teaching in the School of Public Policy. This is an extremely important question. So um, let me start by saying that there's an old saying amongst economists. Every economist in the room, there will be thirteen opinions when Keynes is present, because Keynes himself will have two opinions on everything. Right. So. as a discipline what we try to do is we try to understand human behavior and we try to provide insights about human behavior right so economics if you go back to the title of lipsy's book is a positive science it's a positive discipline so we don't make normative judgments in asking me to take sides you are asking me to make that normative judgment okay now you are teaching in a policy school so you cannot cast that normative hat aside you will have to take that normative step but then that normative step comes with its own assumptions you have to decide what is appropriate i mean there are trade offs you've analyzed as a positive scientist you've analyzed the situation you've laid out everything now you have to take sides and you have to be willing to this uh, example the production possibility frontier go for the classic example guns versus butter right everything comes at a trade off as a policy maker you will have to choose a point on that production possibility frontier but that's a different story so i think if if i was in your shoes i would say that you know there is there is no clear answer this is that's the difference between human behavior and electrons right electrons don't wake up uh, in a bad mood or they don't wake up elated and happy and right, not right. Doing particular thing different yeah. things on different days so uh, they're very consistent but you know we have anger frustration happiness envy all kinds of things drive our behavior so on average people may behave according to one model or the other empirically things can be very different and people can take uh, sides based on their own preferences so that's my sort of broad answer to this i mean i understand uh, i also agree with you that uh, when you are an undergraduate student um, you like clear answers but i think our goal is not to give them the answer but to teach them how to think about problems i think that's that's what i think makes a good economist i mean i you know i worked with engineers uh and i do fairly quantitative stuff and i i think a well trained economist can do better than uh, most people in most disciplines as long as you have the basics because we really encourage critical thinking which is the key point so i'll record this part and play for my class <laughs> I, and and hope to get good reviews <laughs> feel free to do so i mean i'm happy to say this in front of your students at some point if you want Yes, yes. I I would really like because uh, I've been struggling with this that and and that's how I teach. I don't know. Like I I think openly about stuff and and like be it whatever economics that I'm doing. We we are all in some sense trying to solve a problem. So so that's the approach which I've given. So maybe like uh, your book will tell them that it's not so clear, perhaps. i'm not sure this point is raised in the book you know but again another way i like to talk about this is that that you know if you're doing accounting okay if you're in a business school let's say you're doing accounting or or you are a lawyer you have a 9 to 5 job okay 
is when you go home, you don't have to continue that way. But economics right. is not like that. Economics actually teaches you how to think about any situation that has to do with human behavior. So it's you don't switch off when you go home. If you, you want, right. if you want to, you can. You can continue to look around the small things in your everyday life and apply this kind of reasoning. Right, right. Yes, yes, yes. It was yeah, good professor, to talk. Should... Yes. You muted. Professor Sarangi, you, you have to, um, listening to you, I want you to try and formulate an answer. Um, I was asked, uh, the reason I decided I'll study economics was that I grew up in a town called Polar Goldfields, which uh, is now no longer produces any gold, but at one point was a very, very deep mine, um, working mine, um, the deepest it goes three miles below surface. The working conditions are very hard and uh, the workmen could only have a shift of one hour because if you threw water on the ore face, it would come back to you as steam. That's how it was. So one day I was coming back from school and, um, and one of the miners, I mean, they're all Tamil speaking like I am, asked me, uh, he said, you're going to school, you are uh, you know, learning things. So there's a question that's been puzzling me and I want you to give me an answer. He said, you know, we go down these three miles in great depth and we take this ore out and we bring it up and we smelt it using a dangerous uh, substance called cyanide <coughs> in the extraction process. And then we make it into bricks. And then I'm told that we send this to some bank in Bombay where they bury it underground once again. So he said, what is the point of all this? When you take, might as well leave, the gold is underground. You dig it out with such difficulty and putting people's lives in danger. And then you go and bury it again somewhere else. Can you tell me why this happens? Now, I, I thought, you know, this is, this is, you know, I didn't, I, I couldn't answer this man. I just looked at him. And, you know, of course, when they store our value, you know, human beings irrationally value this, <laughs> the metal and so on. But, you know, I think, I think we should be able to, I mean, you know, one of the things that, you know, is to be able to answer a question like this from a guy who genuinely, you see, it's not, it's for him. It's a, it's a, it's a question for what am I doing with my life? You know, <laughs> what is the point, the end point of my hard work in yeah. this place? And I think to convey that is important, right? So uh, I just don't, I don't know how to answer. In fact, I still don't know how to answer this question in, in a few sentences uh, <clears throat> at the end of it. Uh, but, you know, I must say that's what decided that I thought, okay, maybe I should study economics to answer this man. Um, so, you know, but I think students so, are very... Yeah. yeah, so I will say uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, I will try to answer it. I'm not sure that I have... Yeah. the answer. Uh, I, I will also think about it again. And if I come up with a better answer, I will let you know. But for today, as you already pointed out, this is a little bit to do with uh, the diamond water paradox type stuff. What we value more determines the scarcity and what we value more determines its price. So I think if I take the story, uh, the gold as it stands in the ground uh, does not have, ha is, it's like uncut diamond. So if we don't don't cut the diamond, or if we don't add value to it, it doesn't increase. Um, it's not worth a lot. Of, of course, we could say, let's imagine in our heads that we can do this, give the ownership of the gold, uh, gold mine to somebody and not have to take it out because you could say, well, this is the amount of future discounted stream of gold it contains. But the problem with that is you don't know really how much gold there is. So you need to get the gold out. And in the process of getting the gold out, you add value to it. So this is value added. This is the VAT tax. And uh, I'm not exactly sure that the GST is formulated along these lines, but this is the idea of a value added tax, right? So we charge, we, we impose a tax on the value that we added. And then at some point we realize we have added so much value to it because of the levels of scarcity uh, and, and demand and supply, the price is so high that now we need to protect it. Of course, the reason it gets buried underground is because we have decided that is a more secure way of protecting. Now, if we had a way of protecting, which could be to take all of these to an island in the midst of the Indian Ocean, 
where we know it underground, we just even put big blocks of gold on the island and surround the island. That could be another way of protecting. So, so, so uh, literally speaking there, burying underground happens because we have decided that that is secure, but there could be other ways to make it secure. Uh, right. so, so that's how I think it starts its journey from under the ground, given the uncertainties right. to the uncertainty, then the value added, and then we decided we have to store it safe. So we put it again under the ground. Right. That, that, that's, I wish I had knew that answer then, um, you know, but see, these, these, some of these questions are very important and they bother people. And, yeah. and I think one of the, the you know, you, you, useful things about economics is to seek answers to questions. Incidentally, I wanted to say that with regard to your story about unintended consequences, I worked in the UNDP and I worked a lot um, in Afghanistan from 2002 to 2012. I made many, many visits to Afghanistan. And in Afghanistan, the UNDP had a project called Afghanistan New Beginnings Project. Um, nice sounding name. And what this entailed was to say to these uh, warlords and their uh, minions, you hand over your weapons and we'll give you $5 to every gun you hand over, right? <laughs> and, 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 and so the UN was uh, handing out Five dollars, and then it turned out that you know these guys would go to Quetta, purchase whatever weapons they could get their hands on, you know, for about fifty cents, and bring it into um, Kabul and Herat and uh, places like that, and hand it over for five dollars and buy new weapons, which yeah. which were very good in quality. So I mean, this is I mean you know so this it's is a very this, good story. This is this happened, and. And the chap in charge of the Afghan New Beginnings program was an Indian army officer. And he, he realized that this is foolish, but he said, you know, we, 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 the UN and the entire international community wants this, you know, it is as if we will rid Afghanistan of all weapons by offering this $5 thing. And then he said, no, he said, that's not the major problem. He said, you can hand over money, people can buy new guns. The major problem is we have, we burn these weapons which we've collected, right? We, we build a big pile of them and then we, have, we incinerate them. And he says, the, my worry, according to this guy is that the Afghans are sending out small children to collect from what is a hot molding thing, a metal, because that metal has value. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so he says, my concern is about this. <laughs> you know, after having destroyed the bloody weapons, and this is an endless supply of weapons are coming yeah. in, yeah. Yeah. we then expose yeah. children to great danger because the, the, they are being sent to collect the, the, the metal because the copper and the, uh, the brass or whatever metal they can pick up has yeah. resale value. Yeah. So, you know, this is, this is, you know, we have to really figure out how to get policymakers to think about this, to you know, think about um, what might be um, unintended consequences. There are some, I suppose, we can't think about. You know, we eliminated uh, malaria from the Tarai area, of Nepal, India border. Uh, no malaria. Uh, people came to settle in. They cut the trees. They began farming, and now continually we have floods in Bihar. Now I don't think when they decided to eliminate malaria they kind of quite had the knowledge as to what the subsequent consequences might be. So that may be forgivable, but there are some where you should be able to reason out with some logical thinking. Um, no, absolutely. <laughs> but this is the context in which I want to bring up, make the statement that that's the reason why last year's Nobel Prize went to the people it went to, Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo, and Michael Kramer. Because their idea exactly was that if we're thinking of policies, because such unintended consequences do happen, we need to have evidence-based policy making. So we actually go design experiments relating to policy and test them out yeah. and come to conclusions. You, you, but you also pointed out at the same time, one of the shortcomings of this approach, which is these, these experiments usually don't last for more than, you know, sometimes a few months, maybe a year or so. So one doesn't know the long-term consequences, right? So unless you have like a 50 year yeah. uh, experiment, really don't know what the long-term consequences are. So 
Indeed, that's the reason why randomized control trials have become important in economics and also for designing policy. But at the same time, uh, we have to keep in mind that most of these experiments are done on the short run, uh, in the short term, and we don't know what the long-term consequences will be. Shubharan, did you have a question? Yeah, one observation too, that one policy from our side in the next webinar will be that uh, the YouTube channel or YouTube live video can be may not be uh, a good policy for us because we can see like quite a very less number of students out here might be most of them are using their YouTube. So one policy can be next time there is no YouTube link, you will have to come to this one. Well, coming back to uh, if I may ask you one question, and that is from your book only, and being an ardent fan of cricket till now. So uh, my question comes from your chapter where uh, you talk the name of the chapter for a few hours more. And there you have uh, talked about the aggressive and defensive strategy when you're playing, let's say IPL, and when you're playing T20. My only question is, uh, did you take into consideration of the fact like who won the toss and the Duckworth-Lewis method? So when you were doing your empirical stuff, uh, because probably the, this might have some uh, implications towards the result. Like if I win the toss, I may, may opt for a different strategy. So what's your what's your take on that? That's the only question I have. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, in the in the empirical specification or in the regression uh, that we did, we did control for who won the toss. We did control for home team home ground advantage. I mean, at least in T20 and uh, in international matches, you can. For IPL, there is no, uh, you, well, for the particular team, you can still say it's a home crowd advantage because the home crowd is cheering. So if it's your city, then people are cheering. So yes, we did control for that. We control for toss, home team advantage, and uh, some other things I don't remember were some of the other control variables. Uh, Duckworth-Lewis, if there was a match that did have the outcome decided by Duckworth-Lewis, we we, I think, did look at it, but, you know, there are so few because we had two years in which we looked at the data mm -hmm. and there was, there might have been so few that it doesn't matter. Now, I will say one thing and I've been, you know, I've been toying with this idea and I haven't done this. Somebody should actually look at ranking players in cricket using Duckworth-Lewis because we decide match outcomes on the basis of Duckworth-Lewis. Why? Because Duckworth-Lewis takes opportunity cost into account. So I actually went and read the original papers by Duckworth and Lewis, but then I haven't gotten around to working on this. Um, but the, the idea might be to rank. So for example, when you score a century, when your team is about to collapse versus when you score a century in a game that is not really consequential, right? Those should count for ranking of players in different ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right. the, the Duckworth-Lewis approach would take that kind of uh, thing into account because Duckworth-Lewis takes the opportunity cost into account. It's a very economic way of thinking. Uh, so yeah, ranking of players, I mean, that would require more work, but that might be an interesting way to rank players, especially, you know, these rankings of batsmen and rankings of bowlers and so on. And the one last question from my side, uh, since we saw the movie together, Raincoat, in my apartment, I still remember. So my question is, uh, so I see like this, uh, I don't remember the name of the movie, the, uh, what is that, uh, Banno Teri, I don't remember the name of the movie. Right, Banno right. Banno right. uh, Tan 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 yeah. So uh, you, Raincoat is a movie where both parties are bluffing each other throughout. So did you give it an intentional miss in your book or it just happened like that way? Or because it's a very interesting movie where you can actually uh, bring in battle of sexes maybe or whichever part of game theory into the picture and yeah. comes from, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's a very interesting thought. Um, I, it was not deliberate that I skipped the movie. Um, I, I couldn't fit it into anything, but uh, that movie, so at some point, I'm hoping there will be a sequel to uh, this book. Right. And that one will not be about small things. That will be about literature and uh, movies. So maybe in a book like, in that iteration, uh, a movie like Raincoat um, will have a good, you know, sort of maybe a chance of featuring. 
I don't know. I, I mean, I have several, several books and movies that I have identified about which I would like to write. Uh, um, and I've only, I have one chapter written. It's called Waiting in Line for Two Poems by Robert Frost. Uh, so, um, but other things still have to be. Okay, so, so we'll expect that one in the next one, not to worry. So, yeah, so we are left with only uh, like any other questions, please feel free. Almost we have touched the time. And again, I will reiterate like next time our policy should be that we should not telecast in the YouTube, uh, the better be one link where we can gather all the students together. So yeah, and, uh, and I will say, feel free to send me questions. I'd be happy to answer like Professor Sudarshan's question. That was a very nice question. And, and I will use your example on unintended consequences in the future. I like that because it has very serious unintended consequences. Not, I mean, particularly, it's not just that the weapon buying stuff, but what you said about children. I mean, that's really bad. Yeah. Right. Oh, thank you very much for sharing with me. That was, you know, thoroughly enjoyable. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, if, if, we, um, if we have more um, teachers like you, we wouldn't call economics a dismal science. We'd say it's a fun, fun subject. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sarangi, from my side as well, as well as from JSGP and JGU. It was nice having you. And you already mentioned like you visit India twice and your first stop is Delhi. So probably the next visit, I'm quite sure like Professor Shudarshan will be happy to have you not virtually, but in campus and you give a talk to the full house and that will be a great pleasure to us. So from my side, I guess like it's a good night, Professor Shudarshan, is it? Like we yeah, can no, I just wanted to say that um, yeah. one, you know, as part of the history of uh, this university, when it got established, it got established by the philanthropy because our vice chancellor, as a young man, persuaded Naveen Jindal to, you know, contribute the money uh, to do something in memory of his father, O.P. Jindal. But Naveen Jindal had his constituency in Kurukshetra. So he expected that the university could be located there because he's, after all, coughing up 500 crores. Um, Rajkumar said, no, 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 uh, Kurukshetra is too far from Delhi. Then the chief minister of that time, Mr. Huda, his son is the MP for Rotak. He said, you know, please have it in Rotak. Rajkumar said, no, 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 it's too far from Delhi. Uh, and the reason I want this on the border of Delhi in Sonipat is because lots of people will come to Delhi at other people's expense. Then I can send them a nice car and request them to spare six hours of their time and bring them to our campus for an interaction of two hours with the students and send them back. Right? <laughs> so, so I have to be absolutely on the border, right? Which is the Singhu border, is the border where the farmers are now sitting. <clears throat> and then the chief minister said, you know, you know this is an apocryphal story I have to tell you. Um, the, uh, there is something called the Rajiv Gandhi Education City in Sonipat, where Ashoka University is located and other universities are also there. And um, the story is that this was initially, this land was acquired from the farmers by the Huda regime uh, to be able to hand over to DLF, to develop a big resident, to develop a new Gurgaon here in the Sonibat. But the farmers got wind that there's something in the offing that didn't smell very good to them. So they went and complained to Sonia Gandhi that uh, Mr. Huda is playing games. He's acquired our land using the Land Acquisition Act um, for a small sum of money. And we hear rumors that he's going to hand this over to DLF. So Mrs. Gandhi apparently summoned Mr. Huda and said, what is all this? And he, you know, this is, you know, this is a, the politician's game. So apparently he immediately replied, but madam, this is for Rajiv Gandhi Education City this land. So instantaneously, the intended land use was changed and it became land largely by the education city. But my vice chancellor decided he will not take the land there because he then said, if I did that, it's a lease by the government. And then you are in the, uh, you know, the, the government can change the lease terms whenever the lease expires. 
and it's going to be so he decided to, to buy the land so we are not on the main road we are not in the rajiv gandhi education city we are on the border just off the main road but the but the strategic location is intended to grab you the next time you arrive in delhi on your own steam and bring you to our university as a little cost to us but of great benefit to our students and faculty thank you so much professor shashi yes, thank you thank you thank you, yeah. thank you thank professor sargi thank you and have a nice day and good night to dikhil and professor shudarshan anurag yeah so see thank you all again and yeah thank, thank you, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.